Hey, what's up, guys, fellow Atarians? Well, it's been a while since I made the last video, probably a few weeks, and um, I got some good feedback and some good comments on the last video where we took some assembly language and we used that routine in BASIC. Um, I left the challenge at the end for someone to figure out or to make a solution as to why uh, the assembly language routine was freezing after we return from it um, back to basic. And um, actually somebody solved the problem. One of my commenters and followers named Johan Tibelin, I hope I'm saying that right, Johan, Johan Tibelin or Tibelin. Um, he recommended that we put a PLA operand uh, as the first line in our code, which basically will pull the first value from the stack and place it inside the accumulator. The PLA in other architectures is also known as a pop command. So let's take a quick look at what actually is happening when we use the USR function in BASIC and we add the PLA. So let's take a look at this article that I pulled up on the web that talks about the USR command for Atari BASIC. And you can see here they use it just like we used it. We provide a variable x, for example, equals USR and then the memory location. And basically it talks about here how it transfers control from the basic program to the assembly language routine from that memory location that you're supplying as a decimal value inside the parentheses. Um, you can also see here that it works like a go sub. The USR function, uh, the first parameter is the memory location where the routine is and then you can do additional parameters after that. Um, which are basically um, parameters that are passed to the assembly language program. So you can pass um, um, variables to the assembly language or values to the assembly language routine and use them within the assembly language uh, routine. And then upon returning, you can actually um, assign a uh, value to return to basic, which we'll learn how to do in a second, and that'll get assigned to the X variable. So what you have to understand here is that when you call USR, uh, the USR statement is calling the assembly language routine and then the assembly language routine is going to return from its control with an RTS command, return from subroutine, which we were doing properly. You know, that's not something that we did not do. But what we were not taking into account and what I had completely forgotten about is that when you use the USR command, um, you're actually passing the number of parameters uh, to the... Um, the subroutine and the way that that's happening is the number of parameters is being pushed onto the stack and you can see right here returning to basic uh, to return a value to basic when the machine language program has ended all you have to do is store the value that is to be returned in two special 8-bit memory locations before control is returned to basic so d4 and d5 and hex 212 and 213 and decimal you basically want to shove the high and low byte of your return value uh, into d4 and d5 and that value will end up in the X variable. So um, we'll have to try that. We'll have to try that next time when we do some assembly language protein we'll, programming. We'll actually um, return a variable, to, uh, a value to basic that we can then use. Uh, but more, more along the lines of what I was talking about a second ago is that when you use the USR function, um, the memory address of the current instruction in basic, the basic program being run is placed on top of the hardware stack. So that's the first thing that gets pushed on the stack. Then an 8-bit number, which is the number of arguments that appear in the USR statement, is pushed onto the stack. If there are no arguments, like in our example, a 0 is placed on top of the stack. That's what was happening with us. Okay, Since we're not passing any variables or any arguments, uh, a 0 is getting placed on top of the stack. So what ended up happening was in our RTS, uh, we were returning to 0, which was causing it to crash. And that's why clearing the stack must be the first, um, clear the stack right there. You can see it must be the first argument or the first operand in your assembly language routine. Okay. So here's a sample program here where you can see the first instruction is PLA. And they've got a comment that says clear the number of arguments. So in our program, if we were to add a PLA, that first zero that gets pushed onto the stack will get uh, popped, if you will, removed. So that when our program is done, we will end up with the memory address of the next basic instruction, which is what we want. And we're going we're gonna to try that uh, and make sure that that works.
Um, this is a cool program. We'll probably type this in in a future episode. Uh, adding two 16-bit uh, numbers and then returning the sum back to basic. And you can see they're kind of doing that here. They're pulling the two arguments um, after we clear the stack or we, after we pull the, the zero off the stack or the number of arguments in this case is probably going to be three. Um, we'll try that as well. But I wanted to get into this a little bit and show you guys why our program was crashing. All right, guys. So what you have here is our original program that we talked about last time that changed the border colors um, to this rainbow effect. And as you remember, when we were calling this from basic, it was crashing. When we were running it from here, it was fine. So just to prove that, I'm going to assemble it right here in the, um, the assembler editor cartridge. And we're going to run it at memory location 2000. As you can see, it works. And then when we hit a key, it, it breaks out of it. Okay, no big deal. And if you remember correctly from basic, when we tried to do that, the program would just lock. So let's go back and look at that real quick. Okay guys, so here's the program and it's an original format. And uh, let's go ahead and run it. That poked the values into memory. And now we're gonna go ahead and do uh, X equals USR 8192, which is a memory location 2000. As you can see, it, it does what it's supposed to do as far as changing the colors. But now when we hit a key, we're locked up. And that's actually not supposed to happen. What's actually happening now, since we understand how the USR function works is, the value of zero, which is initially pushed onto the stack, is being returned, uh, and that's freezing the computer. Okay, so now we're going to get into how we fix that. Okay, so here we are back at our assembly language program, and the the way that we're going to fix this very simply is, you can see here we've got some space in between line 10 and 20, so we're going to add line 15, two spaces, and we're going to simply do a PLA. And that's it. So now let's assemble. Now, what you have to consider now is now, our last program we started at A2, which was opcode A2, load the execute, uh, load the X register. But now since we've added a new opcode uh, to the program, we've got an additional 68, which basically refers to uh, in decimal value 104. So keep that in mind. Um, as we go back to basic now. So here's our original basic program and now what we need to do is we, had to, we need to add that PLA opcode to the beginning of our program which as you know our program is in fact these decimal numbers here. So we're going to go ahead and insert a line 45. We're going to type data. Now 68 in hex, I've already done the conversion, is 104 in decimal. So now we've got an additional operand opcode here we need to increase the number of uh, room or the number of bytes that we're actually looping through. Since we added one here, we need to add one more value here to our loop to take into account that extra byte that we're adding to the program. Okay. So now we have that in there. Let's take a look at what we have. So now we've got our PLA and then our normal program and all should be good, right? Let's try it. Let's run. And let's do x equals USR 8192, which is our 2000 memory location hex. Oh, what happened now? So not only did we not get the colors, but now we've got a white border. What happened? We forgot something. And I'm not going to make everybody try and figure that out. I'm just going to tell you. The fact that we added um, an operand here, uh, it changed the, the looping mechanism in our assembly language program. If you remember back in the assembly language program, we have some labels created called loop, and we're actually going through and we're looping through indefinitely um, until a key is pressed. Well, one thing you have to realize is that when you add a byte to the assembly language program, the entire program in memory has shifted down uh, by one byte. So I'm gonna show you this real quick, what I did to fix it here. I just happen to know that this value right here this five needs to be a six. And now we're going to rerun this. And we're going to x equals USR 8192. There's our colors. And we press a key and we escape without locking up. Beautiful. That's what we originally were looking for. And that's what our, our PLA 
op, op code is now done for us. Let's talk about this six real quick. Let me get back to the assembly language listing. Okay, guys, we're back at the assembly language listings. Let's do an assemble. And I'm going to go ahead and pause this listing. Oh, we got to do one thing. Since I didn't save it before, let me add that op code back in there. PLA. Okay, let's assemble. Okay. So let's compare this back to the original printout that I had shown you guys. You remember this? Remember when I typed this in the last video? We basically wrote down all our opcodes and operands, A2, F, F, A, E, and so on, and we went down and we converted them to their decimal equivalents. Okay. So basically here, we've got a 68, which has to be included up front, which we did. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and write that in here, 68, and I know that that converts to a 104, okay? So let's compare, 68A2FF8EFC02, it should be all the same as we go down, right? AD0BD48D1AD0AEFC02. E0, F, F, D, 0, 0, 3, 4, C. Here's where it changes. Look, 4, C, 0, 6, 2, 0, where originally we had 4, C, 0, 5, 2, 0. Why did that 5 change to a 6? Well, if you look here, we've got a jump command to a loop. Since we added a byte in the beginning, our jump command moved down one byte in memory. So the assembler knows it, and it adjusted for it, by changing the 5 to a 6. Does everybody see how that worked? We've got an extra byte in the beginning, so our jump to command, which happens to be the loop, okay, it knows in memory it went down by one byte, so we had to, that's why I went in the basic program and I changed it from a, four, uh, a 5 to a 6. Okay, the reason I'm showing this to you guys is remember, if you're going to write an assembly language routine, that you're using in basic and you come back and modify that assembly language routine in any way, shape, or form. You add a byte, you remove a byte, you add uh, a series of bytes or you remove a series of bytes. Um, you need to translate that program opcode uh, by opcode back into decimal values in your data statements. You cannot make a change and then one change in one area and expect it to work just by making that one change into the source code listing. Okay? I hope that makes sense to everyone. Um, but anyway, good job, uh, Johan, for pointing and uh, allowing me to talk about all this extra content. Okay, guys, we're back here at the setup. Now, let's talk about what we have here real quick. We've got our 130XC connected to a monitor. We've got our Atari 1050 disk drive, which is physically connected to the Atari through an SIO cable right here. Okay, everybody see that SIO cable going directly to the back of the Atari disk drive. Let me get this camera over here where you can see it. Okay, here's our SIO cable going directly to the Atari. Now on the back of the Atari 1050 drive, there is what's called a secondary SIU port right here. And what I've done is I've plugged in that um, SIO to USB converter that I showed you. And then I have a USB cable continuing up to this laptop right here, okay, to the USB port on this laptop. All right. And then I have this program here. Let me get this adjusted where we can see it properly. Hopefully you guys can see that and we're not getting too much glare. See if I can adjust this a little bit better where you guys can see it. Let's raise this up a little bit. There we go. And let's go a little more. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm hoping that everyone can see this. Okay, I know it's a little difficult trying to capture this on a camera, but we're doing the best we can here. <clears throat> All 
All right, well, this program right here is called RE, 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 R-E-S-P-E-Q-T, okay? And what this software does, let me zoom in uh, to a specific spot where we can actually you can see the meat and potatoes of what I want you to see here. Are you going to autofocus for me or not? Probably not. Take this off autofocus so that I can focus in on it. How's that? How's that? Is that better? Yes? No? Maybe? There we go. I think that will probably do it for the most. What this program does um, is allows you to mount, as you can see right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. These are actual virtual drives or disk drives, if you will. And what you can do is, for example, this ATR image, ATR2disc.ATR, is mounted on drive two. Okay. That's an actual disk image that I have mounted as a virtual drive two. So to the Atari computer, if I were to switch to drive two and do a directory, I would see the contents of this utility disk, which is called ATR to disk. All right, this second um, mount, which I have on drive three, is Atari 8-bit games. That's a folder. That's a folder here on the laptop called Atari 8-bit games, where I have a bunch of files, and I'll show that to you in a second. This fourth drive here that I have mounted is Atari 8-bit disk utilities. This is also a folder on the Atari, or on, on the Windows. So let's zoom out a little bit here so I can show you those two directories. Okay, let's open up our Explorer here. And you can see here under 8-bit games, this is actually where we have a folder called Atari 8-bit games. And you can see I've got a bunch of files there. Alley Cat, Atari Basketball, BC's Quest for Tires, Beyond, Castle Wolfenstein, and so on. So to the Atari, if I were to do a directory of that drive, I would see those files. So through that USB or the uh, SIO to PC, this program allows me to mount folders and disk images on this laptop to the Atari, okay, where you can actually access them as drives. So I'm going to switch back over to the Atari now so we can take a look at that. Okay, so here we are at our Sparta DOS. And like I showed you before, D2 had a disk image mounted called ATR to disk. And you can see here, I'm reading that virtual directory on the Atari as if there were a physical drive connected there. You see how that worked? Now if I go to drive 3, which was where I had the Atari games mounted folder, I can read those files as if they're a physical disk drive here connected to the Atari. Same thing with D4. If I do a directory of D4, again, that's another disk drive, if you will, as far as the Atari is concerned. Okay? So more importantly, I want to draw your attention to this, this particular uh, disk right here where there's some basic files on there. You can see ATR130K.BAS, ATR180K.BAS, and ATR90K.BAS. Those are the three programs that I want to talk about with you today. And basically what those three programs allow you to do is the first one will take a disk image that is 130K in size. When these disk images are created, from what I understand, they're one of three flavors, 90K disk image, 180K disk image, or 130K disk image. Most of the ones you find are, are either 90K or 130. And I guess the higher density is what the ATR 180K re represents. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take a 90K disk, which I have, um, which, let me take a look and see how big it is. Actually, no, we're going to take the Eidolon, the game that I showed you at the beginning of this video, which happens to be 130K. Let's take a look at that real quick. Okay. You can see it here, Eidolon, nt.atr, 127872. That rounds out to about 130K on the, the Windows platform if you look at it on the Windows directory. So we're going to actually take this file, which is a disk image of the game The Eidolon from Lucasfilm uh, Games, and we're going to 
take that and write it out to a floppy disk that we can then use uh, and boot from as if it were an actual game like I did here on disk. So here's one copy that I made already of the Eidolon. But we're going to go ahead and take a blank disk, this guy right here, and we're going to format it and then we're going to use this program that I just showed you. We're going to use this program, ATR130K.BAS, to transfer that Eidolon program to this disk. So the first thing we need to do is we need to format this disk. So I'm going to take this disk and put it into my 1050 drive, which is plugged in physically to the computer as D1. And we're going to type format, because we know that in Sparta DOS, that's how we format a disk. So here we are with our Sparta DOS formatting utility, and we're going to choose unit 1. For the SKU, we're going to do standard. We're not going to use the ultra high-speed SKU. The density, we're going to do a single. And the mode we're going to do is Atari. Okay, we want this to all be stock, factory, you know, Atari-like, um, you know, format, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do unit one, standard, um, single density, mode Atari, tracks 40, and we're going to hit F to format, insert the disk, press enter. And there we go. We are formatting the disk. And as soon as that finishes, we are then going to use that program that I showed you to create the disk. And actually, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do Mule. We're going to actually do Mule because that's one that I don't have. I don't need another idle on. We're going to do the Mule. So let's go back over here. Let's take a look at that file name for Mule. Okay, Mule.atr. Okay, that'll be that'll work. So if we look at D1 that we just formatted, should be blank, nice and clean. And it is. Okay. So D1 is our destination drive. Mule is going to come from D3. And we know that our utility is on D4. So let's go to D4. And we know the program we want is ATR90K.BAS. So let's go to basic. And let's load up that program. So let's go D, quote, D4 ATR90K.BAS. And you know, this is probably a program that we can look at later on and we can decode it and figure out how it works. As you can see in here, they're uh, writing disk sectors here and look, USR, they've got some actual uh, machine language going on here. And you can see how they put the machine language instead of data statements, <coughs> excuse me. There's a way that you can, you can put the data statements in a string. In other words, you're representing all the decimal values in actual ATASCII, Atari ASCII, a task of characters and one string like this and we're going to show you how to do that as well but this is a really cool basic program that actually reads from a file okay there's a lot of machine language in here that reads from a file and writes out to the destination drive so let's run this and let's it's asking what's the ATR path name well we know I believe it was mule.atr right and the file name well I screwed that up Let's do that again, shall we? The path name is going to be D3. The file name is mule.atr. And the destination drive, I believe it's asking, is D1. Well, well it looks like this program could use a little uh, more um, error checking placed into it. Let's try that again. Apparently, it didn't like the D1. So let's run it again. Let's do D3 as the path for the game. The file name is mule.atr, and let's do the destination drive. Let's just do number one and see if it likes that better. Yeah, it does, okay. So it's asking me, do I want to format D1? No, I've already formatted it, so I'm gonna say no. And let's see if this guy actually works. So it looks like it's actually doing something. I can hear it. I don't know if you guys can hear that beeping. But it's actually reading from that virtual drive over on the laptop. It's reading the mule image, and I'm assuming in a second here it's going to actually start writing it out to the disk, which it is. There we go. All right. I'll probably speed this video up a little bit for you guys so you're not watching the entire process because it probably takes a couple minutes to actually 
write it out. All right. So it looks like it's completed writing the image. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna power this guy off, take out our Sparta DOS cartridge, and let's try and boot the computer with our new disk. Keep your fingers crossed, everybody. Hey, that's a good sign. Electronic Arts. always did like the way they did the loader screens halfway through. Gives you something to look at while it's reading all those sectors. And what do you know it guys? Mule! Very cool. So as you can see we now have a floppy disk that contains the game Mule. And we can now keep this long term in our collection and we can run this game anytime we want from this disk without having to have all the laptop and the external PC and the serial input output to USB connector and all that. We can actually run the computer as it, is, as it was designed, enjoy it in its glory. Woo! Love it. Well, hey guys, I think this video has run long enough. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope the clarification on the assembly language side works. and. Uh, I've had people ask me, why are you making videos on this old computer system that nobody uses anymore? And believe it or not, I try and tell them that learning about the old technology will benefit you in learning today's technology. And just real quick, hear me out about what I mean when I say that. If we can learn how to program using the old technology at a much lower level, like assembly language, what you're getting out of that is you're learning um, about hex, you're learning about decimal values, you're learning about binary, you're learning about procedural programming, you're learning about memory locations and how to manage memory. Um, I guarantee you that everything that we're learning here will benefit you in today's modern programming languages, paradigms, techniques, you know, etc., etc. Um, I can tell you just by going back and rehashing this old basic programming and this old assembly language programming is helping me in doing my, my new stuff, okay? And I've been programming for 25, 30 years now, okay? So um, learning about the stack, you know, learning about pointers, you know, all of this goes into play. So don't let anyone tell you that you're wasting your time by learning retro computing or looking at retro computing. It all makes a difference, okay, guys? So like, subscribe, give me some feedback, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.